Our son's name is Jacob Raymond. And my wife and I had chosen names for a boy and our first two children were girls. And we both thought Jacob would be a great name for a boy. Welcome to Still a Part of Us, a place where moms and dads share the story of their child who was stillborn or who died in infancy. I'm Winter. And I'm Lee. We are grateful you joined us today. Please note that this is a story of loss and has triggers. Thanks to our lost parents who are willing to be vulnerable and share their children with us. If you're listening to this podcast, just know that on our YouTube channel, there are pictures and videos that are related to the stories that are being shared. Subscribe and share it with a friend that might need it and tell them to subscribe. Why? Because people need to know that even though our babies are no longer with us, they're still a part of us. The day we announced we were having a baby was on my was on our second daughter's birthday and my parents came over for like the first time they you know it's only they're only 12 hours 12 miles away from us yeah but because of covid they hadn't been over in like six months or something yeah and my wife's parents came and they hadn't been over in ages too and are they pretty close to you guys too? They're about eight hours away. Oh, okay. They're closer to you actually than they are to <laughs> us. Um, so we're all together for our daughter's birthday. And we announced that we were having a baby. And an hour, not even an hour later, it's just, I don't remember how long, five, 10 to 20 minutes, don't remember got a phone call that my uncle had died from COVID Mm -hmm. and we were expecting it, but it was like the highest high followed by the lowest low. Yeah. And he, the anger that comes from that too, where, you know, Jacob's death kind of compounded it is that my uncle had cancer. So he, you know, he was compromised. But he, you know, he did everything necessary to stay safe, to, you know, even, I know a lot of people did the right thing and they still caught it and still couldn't live through it. But in my uncle's case, he caught it at the hospital from somebody he was supposed to share the restroom with, which he never should have. And he caught it from the patient next to him. And we watched him die on the phone, basically. So then to have this, you know, terrible experience, because he was such a close family member, to then have Jacob die was just like another... It's a kick in the teeth. It made me very numb like a like a numbness of yeah what's that phrase carry the world on your yeah carry the world your heart on your sleeve or something there's the wear your wear your heart on your sleeve and carry the weight of the world on your shoulders and i wish i didn't sometimes but you know it's when you have kids you think what kind of a world are we making for them we're leaving them and right now it looks pretty crappy (laughs) and so to have these, you know, these bad things happen, it's easy to feel sorry for yourself. It's easy to, you know, blah, uh, kind of block yourself out from friends, which I haven't had much interaction with my friends for a long time, and that's on me, but... Maybe that's just the way it is with people when you get older, too. It's yeah. harder to do those things. But yeah. And, you know, there's when you're farming, there's always, you know, risks of injury. And that actually happened a couple 
you know, two, three weeks after Jacob died, about two weeks, we had been, we had gone out to uh, see Becky's family over what would have been his due date mm. out in Western Nebraska. And it was nice to get away to be and to be together. And when we finally got back here, I was out at the farm for an hour when my dad called and had told me that Daniel had, my brother had been attacked by a cow and he ended up having a whole bunch of ribs broken, oh. like eight or nine ribs and had to go into some serious surgery. And so there was like all of a sudden, like here's, you know, a lot of responsibilities that I had to get my head back into the game pretty yeah. quickly. There wasn't time. There wasn't time for you. No. Nope. And, you know, as someone who's lost a child this way, you know, it's a lot easier to ask somebody how your, your brother's doing after an injury versus how you're doing after yeah. your baby dies. So that's something I had to try to figure out. That like, oh, how's your brother doing? And I wanted to, I started telling people which one because I have two brothers. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just, uh, it's just, you, you're in very, you, you feel very alone because you just don't, unless you've gone through this before. Like I watched the uh, Becky and I watched the episode where you and your wife were talking about things you may have said before this happened to you that you think, wow, why did we say that or not say this? Mm -hmm. And I know it's a very hard thing and everyone takes it differently and reacts differently. But I think you, you had said like, sometimes just the best thing is like, how are you doing? Or, you know, an arm around the shoulder, But there's that kind of, maybe it's a Midwest thing. Maybe it's global. I don't know, but it's just easier not, not to, to talk do it. Yeah. about it because, you know, I don't want to upset the person. Yeah. It's, I truly do believe that people feel if I bring it up, it's going to cause issues. And so why bring it up? And it's just easier not to bring it up. And it's like, you know, that's, that's not how it should be. Mm -hmm. We are hurting inside. We truly are needing camaraderie or compassion or, or, you know, I don't, I don't know how to express it, but we do need someone to take us and say, Hey, I'm sorry. And I'm, and I'm, and I'm here for you and I'm here with you, but it's hard for people to do that. It's, it's a, there's a stigma around it for sure. Yeah. Even, you know, today, you know, when we, we heard a number of stories, very disturbing stories of people who had, you know, similar tragedies in our hometown here mm -hmm. that, you know, 30, 40 years ago happened and how, how much worse it was then even, of course. Yeah. And so, you know, we've come a long way, but it's still, there's still a long way to go. Yeah. So, you know, the best thing that I feel like I can do is, you know, I, we have three kids and when people ask, you know, about that, that's what I tell them. And it's not like I'm looking for attention or for sympathy. No, well, you're not. Uh, you're, you're, you are stating what your family is. So. Mm -hmm. But as far as like people reaching out to you or talking to you about it, that's, you know, I don't want to feel like I'm, I don't want to feel needy. Mm -hmm. It's hard not to, not to feel needy. That's a, it's a strange place to be. Yeah. Yeah, it is. As, as a man and as a father, and I, I, you know, I don't want to assume but you feel 
an obligation to your wife. You feel an obligation to your family. You feel obligation to your sphere of influence. It would be two o'clock, three o'clock in the morning when it was absolutely quiet. Everybody was asleep and I just break down just for myself. It was Mm -hmm. like, there's nobody around me. It, and I had no clue why I was up at two o'clock in the morning besides just having time for myself. And it was the worst. It was the worst feeling to be just completely isolated. You know, didn't want to, I, I, you know, didn't want to disturb my wife. Just all by myself. I'd go walking every once in a while and just be, just be total alone. And it was terrible. I haven't had those moments of really like letting, you know, breaking down, but not for a long time, but it's, there's still a emptiness and a, like a loneliness that you yeah. know, even your wife can't. Yeah. Cause that's just the way it is. And I try to lose myself in music a lot. Sometimes there's, I've always been a, fan of music that some people would say is pretty depressing but it's always been like a warm blanket for me so i'll uh i'm i'm also an audiophile i i love music so i'm a seattle grunge guy <laughs> sunday day real estate mm, allison chains ah pearl jam yeah good old Town garden yeah. mother love bone yeah there's, you know, there are songs that came into my head that were stuck in my head, like, for days, all day long. And, you know, the and that's something that's happened to me for years. I'm a drummer, and so music's always been an important part of me. And so these certain songs that, you know, would trigger events in my past and mm-hmm. now are, you know, even more so uh, meaningful. But I also, you know, I'll try to, I don't always listen to depressing music. Too. <laughs> so I like to listen to jazz and uh, classical. And I know the music I listen to, the best music out there. So we'll just leave it at that. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, Music is a great conduit to to, mm-hmm. to emotions, to understanding. So, yeah. Yeah. one of the most important things for me, though, as as I'm trying to figure out myself, is also trying to be there as much as I can for Becky, mm-hmm. because of the the difference that a mother has in her understanding of this that i'll never you know begin to understand Mm -hmm. but just trying to be a support for her because she's a clinical therapist clinical psychologist so she hears a lot of people and you know terrible things that are happening to these people in their lives and and it's there's a lot of self-care that's necessary in that field and after a hard, you know, long day at work, yeah, the last thing she needs is to feel like she has to, you know, give me therapy. Um, but we are still very, we're on each other's the same page, and you know, she, like I said, she's the parenting of Jacob is far more. Like, you know, I'm just looking at all the things that she has sitting next to me that she used for. In her interview and <laughs> books and our bear that our weighted bear that we had brought to us from the hospital. <sighs> yeah, what what a... Same way <laughs> as Jacob when he was born. But our daughters put pajamas on him. <laughs> but, you know, I came with nothing. 
Wow. So, and, you know, the only thing I really did was after he died, I, you know, I don't have a smartphone. I have once I have a Facebook account and that's it. And I've made a, and I never use it or very rarely use it. I made a post on there about Jacob and I put some lyrics from a Pearl Jam song I always liked, uh, Given the Fly. Mm-hmm. And at the end of the song, it talks about uh, seeing some a strange spot up in the sky. And it's, you know, I feel like, oh, it's Jacob. And then the other song was uh, by a band called Neutral Milk Hotel. I like Neutral Milk Hotel. So, you know, the airplane over the sea song. And those those lyrics are, uh, what a beautiful face that I found in this place that is circling all around the sun. And when we meet on a cloud, I'll be laughing out loud. I'll be laughing with everyone I see. That's part of it, at least. But I've made, put those two lines together and was a picture of a bird that was on one of them. And Becky had it printed out for me and put it in a frame. And so I have it on my desk in the basement where I, after Becky goes to bed, I go down into my cave and try to stay afloat. It's hard to stay afloat sometimes. Mm -hmm. As the waves are crashing down. It's odd for for me too. And I mentioned this once that I've done a couple online therapy Mm -hmm. sessions. And the first one was a couple's one. And it was so, it was very hard for me to be a part of it because I felt so terrible for the people, everyone else there. That, like not that anyone else's story is you know you don't want you're not judging stories by how bad it is you don't want to yeah i mean the end result's the same maybe how they get there can be worse but Mm -hmm. it's it was just wasn't very easy and then another one i did was with other dads was i mean it was good but it was just it's just so sad. Mm-hmm. There's just so much, there's so much sadness. And that's, I don't know if that's the kind of thing for me. Yeah. To, and, you know, I, I, I know talking about things help, but, but the thing that I mentioned during both of these, these sessions was as a farmer, as a livestock farmer, you know, and the same, this could be said for, you know, a doctor or a veterinarian, mm-hmm. but you, you see death. Yeah. And for people who have never really witnessed death or at least enough times to, you know, animals die yeah. and we are animals. And unfortunately, sometimes, you know, things like this happens. And so something that's, I've tried to, that's helped me, I guess, you know, like we, when it comes down to it, we're all animals and unfortunately these things happen and that's helped you know, I haven't blamed anyone or anything, but it's helped me with the yeah. trying to understand, like, we actually know what happened. Not, you know, very few, there are not very many people get to, are told, like, why their baby died. Yeah. And we were told immediately by my mother-in-law, actually, who delivered our baby, who's a oh. um, midwife, who delivered our two daughters. And what a blessing it was to have her there, to be there with her daughter, you know, with Becky and and with me at our lowest points of our life. Yeah. Truly, I mean, the, I think she, my mother-in-law and I have a connection now that will last forever, a deeper connection. Yeah. Um, so I'm very thankful for all that she's done sort of going back we meant we mentioned our 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 religious beliefs and stuff like that and and i was reading a comment on on one of the forums and it's like 
how could a God ever allow a child to die? And it's like, you know, God made a perfect world, which then became, you know, and this is just my, per, my personal philosophy. Um, you know, God made, made, God made a perfect world. God made perfect bodies for humans. And when mortality was introduced into humanity, that was then the catalyst for us to return to heaven. You know, if, if, if everybody lived perfectly, there would be no purpose for us to return to heaven. Yeah. And it's like, you know, death. Yeah. It's, it's, it's sad. It's tragic. It's, it's horrible, you know, be it, be it in war. You know, I've got friends in Ukraine and it's, you know, I, uh, you know, war, old age, death, car accidents, you know, anything. And, and, and even, you know, with our sons, it's tragic, but it's part of the process. And, you know, could God stop it? Yes, he could. But then it would defeat the purpose of what his creations were for, for us to come to earth and, and, and experience mortality and prove ourselves to be good or bad and then return and report to God. And it's like, you know, when, when, when I read that comment, it was like, how could a God, how could a, you know, and it was really condescending and I, I deleted it right off the, you know, mm-hmm. but it was like, you know, I don't think God views and you know this is a complete tangent but i don't think god views the tragedy of death as as an end but a returning and just because we can't remember where we came from or truly imagine where we are going it's the fear that we have but but god knows yeah, it's it's easy to say God knows because God does know. <laughs> but and that's all we need to know. Yeah. If we believe in God, what else is there? Yeah. You know? But God knows. We don't know what God's plan is, but we can we can guess all we want. Yeah. And I think what you said is probably the you know, is the one I would agree with the most. Yeah. It's, no, we don't know. And so let's just that's where we you know so many people who are proving that they are bad people in our world yeah. make it so hard for good people to, to fulfill what, what are, <laughs> you know, yeah. There, it's just, oh man. Yep. It's like you're the miracle. Let's look at it this way. Like, okay. My, my son couldn't make it out of the womb alive and he, but he still had his, has a great impact mm-hmm. on us a great impact on family and yeah. um, you know, we Becky was able to raise a, a lot of money for some wonderful organizations that support families who lose children and maybe can't afford a, uh, a service or, you know, anything mm-hmm. after that. So Jacob had an impact, a positive impact and he wasn't even alive outside of, yeah, outside of the womb. And, something that Becky and I talked a lot about was like, you know, every birth is such a miracle in the first place. Like we, it's a wonder that any of us are, Yeah, I mean, yeah, science has greatly improved it and is continuing to get better. But But when it comes down to it, we're all still miracles. So why, if you are alive in the world, why are you spending your time making everyone else's life miserable? And then some, and so it's just, it's an aggravated, aggravating feeling of, those people, you know, <laughs> prove themselves <laughs> bad people, like you yeah. said. Yeah. Yes. The uh, my I get my, stuck in my head a lot. Uh, right? My my seven year old daughter. We joke about me being a crotchety old man, but it's those days are coming for me too. <laughs> I I always I always laugh because I'm starting to get gray and and stuff and i'm like oh good yeah now now i'll actually look like the old man yelling at people but 
I'm I'm truly not a, a cantankerously old, crotchety old man, but I I have lost patience with stupidity, and I uh-huh. guess that is I guess that is why I've become a. I'm just like you know, there's too many stupid people, and if I had the magic button to get rid of half of the stupid people, that would be great. Uh-huh. Or at least send them all to somewhere else but yeah that's where i lately i've been listening to too much rage against the machine hey i find myself even maybe angrier than usual but it's that mindset too of like well if you're if you don't like something then do something yeah. about it and that's where i'm so stuck yeah. like i have all these opinions and everything and then just but it's just there's so much cynicism yeah and you know it's easy to get bogged down in your own life like i think of people who the people we've met who were with these foundations who like what you and your wife are doing who you know after a tragedy are healing while helping others and you know so i commend you and your and winter for that and thank you people that we've met along the way here who are are doing tremendous work to help families um, after suffering their own tragedies. And, you know, there's a good community of people out there. We, you know, a man is not made to be alone, but sometimes we are. Yeah. But Well, now that we philosophized yourself into immortality, would you like to tell us about your son? It's hard, but it's, it's, I never got to see his eyes. Yeah. And there was no autopsy because we knew, you know, the cord was wrapped around him. And dark hair. I think he would have been a good, strong kid. Um, I can picture my grandma talking in her pol in a, her Polish accent. Uh, she's been gone a number of years now, but her mom came from Poland as an orphan, and so she would talk in her her mom's accent, <laughs> strong as an ox, strong as an ox. I can't do an accent, but. Uh, yes, she would talk probably like this, as strong as an ox. Yeah, that's pretty good. Mm. Um, and her family is all from eastern Poland, so right on that Ukrainian border in that area. Yeah. Uh, but, I mean, he... Do I remember exactly what, you know, his height and weight and all that stuff? No, but I know like if he had been born alive that day, he would have been just fine. Um, and that's where there's a lot of, I know Becky has a lot of, have, has had a lot of thoughts about that. Like, what if I did this or that? Yeah. Like, it doesn't matter. You can't, how do you know? Um, Becky was convinced that he looked like our second daughter, Ellie. Same nose. Holding him felt felt good. Talking to him felt good. With, you know, with a, just a terrible hurt underneath it all, of course, but that last goodbye you know Becky and I both had time together with him for you know that 24 hours about and then we both had our own time before he said goodbye Mm -hmm. to his body and that was that's something I will never forget you know each individual detail of that moment the sun was coming through the window and just the day before it had been rainy, crappy. 
it was uh, May 4th. Um, so he's our Star Wars baby. May the 4th be with you. Um, but then there were little things after that that you just want to things that you wouldn't think twice about in any other day of your life or you know without this experience you know but the reality is of life like okay we have two kids that need a parent here and they need somebody needed allergy medicine so i went to the walgreens nearby and after making my purchase the cashier says would you like to donate a dollar to help save children Mm. And I lost it there. But time has, I guess, has helped that at least. But yeah. we have a little memorial set up for Jacob in our home. Um, we had these really nice bookshelves made for us by a local carpenter. And one of the shelves is dedicated to Jacob until so we have his his ashes up there and some little figurines that uh, kind of serve as our two daughters and I don't remember what they're called but the they're pretty popular now where um, where in the house is is this shelf we call we call it cozy corner <laughs> this is the room that we live in an old farmhouse yeah and this would have been uh, a parlor i believe we looked in, you know initially it's the front of the house yeah we don't have uh, any tv you know no screens in there and it's where kids can go play and read and draw and color and bounce around and listen to music they have their own little cd player and uh, and there's Jacob up on a shelf. Um, and other little things that, you know, at the, at our farm, there's a, a portion of the farm that was once another farmstead mm -hmm. decades ago that everything's been, been torn down, but we would find my dad and my brother and I would, would find marbles a lot from kids who had lived there yeah. you know, who knows how long ago 50, 60, 80, 90 years ago I mean, like a ridiculous amount of marbles <laughs> what's wrong, how many marbles do you, can one person lose well, and everybody loses their marbles right uh, somebody lost a lot of marbles and I'm I'm always picking things off the ground and obsessive compulsive with recycling and finding stuff and uh, collecting and uh, just asked by my poor wife. <laughs> but I was thinking, you know, if I find a marble, I'm going to say it's a, a hello from Jacob. And so I'd be walking through this yard if I was moving cattle or that's the only reason I'd be walking across the yard, moving cattle yeah. from one place to another. And it took a little while, but I found one. And, you know, the colors don't mean that much to me as far as kids go, but it was a blue marble. And I thought, well, that's pretty much perfect. And I thought, there's, there's my hello from heaven. Like, hey, I'm here. Everything's fine. So that's up on the shelf too. Do you still collect those marbles as hellos oh, yeah. from Jacob? I haven't found any since. Ah. I think maybe I've picked them all up because I have dozens of them. Oh. So that's little things like that. I look for meaning. When we were kids, you know, my grandpa died the year, just a year to two, like a year and four months before I was born mm -hmm. and my dad was 30 years old at the time and had only been farming you know eight years by himself and 
I remember as a kid when we were driving somewhere or, you know, could see a beautiful sunset, you know, out in the horizon, out with, you know, when you, when you have a farm, the sunsets are pretty, can be pretty amazing. Yeah. And my mom, for whatever reason, would say, like, oh, there's grandpa, he must be making candy in heaven. You know, pinks and oranges and all kinds of different colors. And, and so my brothers and I would, would uh, you know, our imaginations would go with that. And, mm -hmm. and then when we got older, I thought, I remember one day asking my mom, like, did grandpa ever make candy? Like, no, just that's something we just said to, you know, maybe to help try to make dad feel better. And so after, you know, Jacob died, when we started, see, you know, we'd see a pretty sunset, I would tell the girls, Jacob's eating candy in heaven. So if we see a really pretty sunset, Jacob's enjoying some delicious candy of some kind. So that's, that's little things that I, you know, I need to remind myself to keep doing though too. Yeah. Because it's easy to get into it. A routine, which sometimes routines are great, but they can keep you from doing work that's necessary. Yeah. Now, David, if if there's anything else you would like to talk about, or it's been good, it's been it's been good for me to to sit and right. chat about so many things. You know, our our children are always with us. And talking about our children is wonderful, mm -hmm. but also talking about those little subjects around it is also is always good. So, could I pause for a second and go grab two things to show you? You betcha. One I just realized, and the other. I'll get back. Yeah. <clears throat> Okay. This is that. Hey, there's one. that blue one. Yeah. Hello, <laughs> ah. Your little, your little hello from heaven. Yes. And there's Jacob's hat. Everyone had a little. Every baby has a little hat made for them at the hospital. Yeah. Well, we have that up, that up on the shelf. That's up there too. <laughs> the May the Fourth. Yeah. Or the shorts, one or the other. There's a candle. Oh, okay. Now, uh, what's the significance of the candle? This was uh, shared with us from one of the foundations, mm. uh, Star Legacy Foundation, that we have been a part of, okay. um, and has been really have been really good to us. Um, so. We bring it with us. When my youngest brother got married, yeah, last November he got married out near Washington D.C. And so we brought this candle with us and had it there on the table with uh, other family, mm -hmm. and, you know, like the grandpas and grandmas who couldn't be there. And, uh, so that was nice. You know, I was thinking too when you mentioned. Took me a while to think of this, but as far as parenting your your son, uh, along with my collecting, comes one of these days I'll fill them out. But for each of our children, uh huh, this is Maggie. I got them this uh, United States Mint. Yeah. Uh, little birthday coin deal and so we have so that the, someday this will be theirs you know? yeah there's Ellie I thought she might not be here with us but yeah you know there's Jacob so we're going to get his picture in there 
So that's his birth year, you know, that's just because he wasn't alive outside the womb doesn't doesn't mean he didn't exist. Yeah. And that's so I will celebrate him by you know little things like that. Someday, you know, the girls can have his birthday coin. Yeah. So you know, it's what what you said, um, hearkening back later, the impact that he has had on you, on your family, and on on the influence that you have in other people's lives. You know, even though he was not born alive, he lives on through you and your wife and your girls and those who are are associated with you. Sure. You know, the way I have changed since my the passing of my son has affected how I have lived my life. And I hope for the better. I, I truly do believe for the better. And his his life has touched me and I now have to touch other people's lives through that. Sure. And so I, I'm I hope people know our children mean so much to us. Our living children and our children who have died. They mean the world to us. And it's 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 hard it's hard to every single day be there. It's hard as a parent, no matter what, because we're human. <laughs> and sometimes we lose our tempers and sometimes we you know, we're not perfect. Mm-hmm. But it's it's as as a parent, it's nice to know that we're trying our best. So sometimes I pray to Jacob that I find the courage and strength to make our world a better place for his sisters mm-hmm. for the future. Yeah. Yeah, he's he's still he's a big deal to us, that's for sure. Yeah. We will always have a son. He'll always be with you. Well, thank you, David. Thank you.